All right, good morning. Okay, we are in Ezekiel part two, lesson two. And because we had two weeks to accomplish our lesson, we only ha we did get both less both chapters in. We did the full the full study of, of lesson two. Starting next week, we will be breaking it down again into a part A and a part B in order to not overwhelm us with too many chapters. Uh, you will be really thankful when we get into the temple part <laughs> because there's so much detail and it'll be a bit overwhelming for everyone, including me. So um, I've done it already. A couple times but still it's it's a lot so just so you know where we're headed today we will be discussing Ezekiel 35 and Ezekiel 36 and um, I think that by way of just reminder of where we've come from can someone just tell me again who is the author what is the historical setting what's going on here <coughs> who is the human author I should say Ezekiel. it is Ezekiel and Ezekiel is who He's a prophet that God chose, right? He, he chose him to be the watchman, the prophet, and the priest, right, for, for Israel. Where were they historically at the time when he wrote? They were in Babylon by the river Chabar. We get all that in the, those first three chapters. Uh, then what does God spend those first 24 chapters discussing? What's the first 24 chapters of Ezekiel all about? It's all about Israel, specifically which part of Israel? Because which siege are we in? We're getting ready. We're already completed the second siege. We're, and everything he discusses is concerning that third and final siege, correct? So we're, re we're ready to get to the, to the place by the end of 24 where God has done what he has been prophesying through Ezekiel through this whole time. What was the problem with, with Israel in hearing that message from Ezekiel? They didn't believe it because they thought they were in the pot. Right, it said in one of the passages. They believed they were, because they were situated in particular in Jerusalem, which is where the temple of God was, and that in, in their opinion had that, that divine protection because of the presence of God. They were soon to find out otherwise, right? Because what did we learn in chapter 12, um, 11 and 12 right in there of Ezekiel? What happened? God left. He left his temple, then he left his city. So. Uh, if that wasn't a strong enough message to them, it took a few more chapters from 11 all the way then into 24, and he kept repeating to them that these are the things that God was doing. And what was the reason that God left his people and, and removed them off of the land? Their sin, their idolatry lack of repentance all of the above right so what does that tell us then about God in relationship with even Israel who is his chosen people he is just yes he's just he disciplines and do they get a free pass just because he chose them to be something for him no so there are no free passes with God so what does that tell you and I today no free passes for us either Right? If we are going to bear the name of Jesus Christ and wear that coat that says across the back of it, I belong to Jesus, if we're going to put that crown upon our head and say, I am a daughter of the king, then what is our responsibility? Obedience. Obedience right? We must, uh, we must exalt God's holy name. We must live according to the standard of his written word, which was the, the, the book of the law, right? Actually, the whole Old Testament, the law and the prophets, Jesus preached about himself through the law and the prophets. Through that, what God d d tells us then in James concerning that, there's or even in Matthew, there's really only a couple of things that we really have to uh, consider without going you know, crazy and saying, okay, now I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. What did Jesus bring it down to? What did he say? You have to do two basic things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and the second is likened unto it, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so James says about that, that's the royal law. And James says that faith without works is dead. And so this is actually demonstrated to us right here in the book of, of uh, Ezekiel. We have seen all through here that God is saying, if you're in relationship with me, you must be living it. And there must be a contrite heart, a repentance, 
There must be works that demonstrate your relationship with me is true and genuine. And you must do one more really important thing for me. What were they called out to be for God as a nation? Why did he pick Israel? Yep, they were to be the light to the nations, that the whole world would see who their God was, and therefore they would desire to come into this faith relationship. Okay, so that is, in the, what? Oh, because it's like, yeah, well, and I know, and it's so, and it's so sad because um, then we move into to Romans, and Kay took us into Romans 11 again this week, and what did we see in Romans 11 about our relationship then with God now in the New Testament for you and I for application? How, how do we relate to Israel as the chosen people? That's right. We've been grafted in. And because we've been grafted into the promises and the blessings, right? Now, that does not mean God is saying to the church, I'm going to put you on the land. I'm going to make you do all these things, right? But he is saying you're grafted in, and you're grafted in for a design purpose, which is to, again, do what? Bring God glory and bring light to the world. That's right. So, in a way, we walk side by side with our sisters. We are companions with them in this relationship with God, but we are also distinct, which comes down to an understanding that there are dispensations in Scripture. Now, I know that's a big word, and a lot of people get real, you know, kind of off-put when you start talking too much theological, t technical words, but, you know, there really are is a program. God has from the very beginning in Genesis all the way to where we are presently, and he's told us about what the rest of the program is, but it seems like there are programs that he accomplishes first in this way, then he does it in this way, then he does it in this way, right? So that there are some distinctivenesses to each of us. That's why Israel has a distinctive role. And it's also why Daniel, when he gave his prophetic utterance to them about those last days called the, the, 70th, the 70 weeks of Daniel, and he said in that 69th week is yet in the future, but it's for designed to be for who? That 70 weeks. For Israel, for, for Daniel's people and their holy city. So that prophecy is for them specifically. So where do we fit into that? What happened between week 69 and week 70? Uh, not well, eventually it will, but, but what, it, what do we call that dispensation? That church age. We are living in this gap period called the church age. Um, now, I understand that different people have different eschatology mindsets but this is where I'm coming from and it's it's what we have through precept learned concerning uh, eschatology where things kind of fit so Israel was being worked with th uh, through God with God by God uh, in those first 69 weeks up to the time when Jesus came his death burial resurrection then the church was birthed now we have a 69 we're, we're waiting for that 70th week those 69 weeks are finished so here we are in the church age we, we, like Israel, are to be the, the light bearers to the world to, to glorify God, who he is. And so that's where we fit into this. So now that you know that, now we got to step back and say, okay, so what is Ezekiel talking about? Who is he speaking to specifically? Who is his audience? Is it the church age and us? No. Does some of the things in here absolutely apply to us? Yes, so there's some things that apply, but technically and specifically, this is speaking to Israel and to their nation. So if we know that up front, then we won't try to impose ourselves into it and try to make it say something it's not saying. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Yay. All right, everybody loves it. And that made my life really easy. Okay, <laughs> see, that's why it's helpful to have everybody believe whatever you're <laughs> saying here. Okay, now, okay, so let's go into Ezekiel 35 and begin our homework together. Now, what we want to do is talk about our, your keywords in Ezekiel 35. When you did your observation worksheet, the very first thing you do is you look for keywords. Why do we look for keywords? What is the purpose of a keyword? Yes. Because what it does is then it identifies for you the subjects, right? And when you get two or three different subjects figured out, then how do you determine which one is your major theme? How do you determine that? Well, those subjects have different 
Yeah, whatever is mentioned the most, and sometimes your secondary, second, third, and fourth subject matters are, are support uh, uh, subjects to the major theme. So what you have to do is often you're going to make lists. Your list making, the one that seems to be the biggest generally is the one that is your major theme. That's how you kind of de determine that. Now, the reason that's an important skill to learn um, in doing Bible study is then it becomes objective interpretation rather than subjective. You don't pick out the subject topic that you love and get stuck on it, right, and say, oh, it's all about this. And for most Christians in the New Testament, it's all about love and salvation, right, and about, it's all, you know, about grace. It's all grace, grace is all the more. But, but that is not a healthy way to look at scripture ever. So that's what we did here. So Ezekiel 35, key words were what? Desolation. We see desolation. But now, again, to prove my point, is that the major subject? Okay, what is the desolation speaking to or about? Desolation of what or who? Mount Seir. Mount Seir. So the desolation subject comes up, and it's an important one, and it's really big, but it's not the major subject. The major subject is desolation for who, right? It's for Mount Seir. So Mount Seir becomes the major subject in this particular chapter. So Mount Seir and desolation, any other words or any other people groups that are mentioned in here? So who is Mount Seir specific? Edom. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in more detail because I've got a nice little list we're going to make together. So, so Mount Seir and Edom, and who else? Israel. Always Israel. Have you noticed that? They keep coming up in this book. <coughs> Again, because God is using Israel in that time in history and for that specific role and work, so they always are going to be, be coming up. It's kind of like God almost always comes up in every single chapter, almost, <laughs> like over and over and over, right? Okay, so Mount Seir, Israel, desolation. Any other key repeated words or phrases? Bloodshed became a real big one, right? It's particularly right there in the middle of the chapter, right? <clears throat> Verses 6 in particular. There you go. Now, I put ang anger and hatred and envy, and I just marked them all the same because they were basically, it's just talking about the emotional yeah. relationship between Israel and um, uh, Mount Seir, what was going on there, right? And I included the and there's another good one, arrogance and reviling. Very good. Okay, and that was helpful. This one of the, the one of the good things about um, understanding what your keywords are all about. Instead of marking each keyword separate. Hey, Karen, glad glad you made it. <laughs> are you okay this morning? Oh, you're being such a good grandma. That's awesome. We're total pass, total, total excuse. You get your, you get your pass for sure. Okay, because we all know it's all about the grandkids. <laughs> That's just why we had kids to begin with. All right. Uh, okay. So um, now, where was I thinking? Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but all these different key words. Now, one of the things that happens is, you know, some books are different than other books. You kind of have to know how to handle them, but. In this, in this particular chapter and book on the whole, some chapters have a lot of repeated words that are similar and are kind of conveying the same thing but use different words, right? But because they're conveying the same message about the same subject, like anger, hatred, envy, what was the other one? Reviling. Reviling. Okay. All that's talking about the emotional relationship between Mount Seir and Israel. Therefore, those words could be all just marked in the same way. When I have words like that come up throughout all of Ezekiel, I have been doing this, I just color all of them under the subject of sin. So I just do a little gray shadowing over them because that's icky, you know, it's darkness. And I put a little lightning bolt on top of it and that tells me that's a sin factor. And therefore I can always tell where the sin, the sin is that's going on in that particular chapter. Okay, all right. Um, Time references. Is there any kind of a time reference in here? Verse 5. Yes, verse 5 is a big one, and it's kind of an interesting one, right? Because you have had everlasting enmity. Now, that's a really good one. Everlasting, meaning what to us? 
Always, forever and ever and ever. So it's basically, from the beginning, there's always been this hatred. And have delivered Israel to the power of the sword at the time, what? Of their calamity, at the time of what? The punishment, the punishment of the end. Now, that one can tri trip you up a little bit. Yeah. Which end is he speaking of? Well, what happened during the time of that punishment of the end? What had, ha what had these people from Mount Seir done to the sons of Israel? In verse 5, they delivered to the power of the sword. So d is that something that happened during the days of Ezekiel, or is that something future? During the days of Ezekiel, right. So the end then of what? Whose end? What came to an end? Whose end is it saying? Yeah, Israel's end. Now, what is, yeah, that Israel, you're done. Now, what does that mean? Now, we know that Israel will go back on her land, correct? Um, but when she goes back on her land, how does she go back into her land? In what capacity? Does she have an autonomy over her own nation? No, she's no more of an independent. Yeah. So what kind of an end is it speaking of? The end of their independence as a nation, right? They're never again going to rule themselves until something else happens in history where God is going to begin to reestablish them as his nation, which is what we're going to get into in 36 and 37, right? So real interesting to kind of parse that down. There's a couple of time references in there. You really, and, and having done Ezekiel helps you to really parse that out. But you do have to ask the question, well, who's in and why did they come to in? How did they come to in? And when did that happen? And you have to kind of evaluate each of those pieces to say, okay, because it's real easy. And I did it when I was first marking it before I really did any of my work on it. I marked the end as in the end times. <laughs> and then I had to go back and go, oh, wrong end. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay, so, so that end is 586 BC, if you want to pick a note on that the end of Israel as an independent nation okay so that's a really excellent time reference there we do see another one in nine I will make you what everlasting, everlasting desolation <clears throat> now is that something that is present or future now we're going to talk about that in more detail because I've heard some people say it's already done but but then again yeah I'm, I kind of went what how is that possible because prophecies say about at the end time what is God going to do more judging on Edom right so and Obadiah says it Isaiah says it Jeremiah says it so so obviously although there was a partial fulfillment of God's work against Edom apparently the Edomite people and their hatred and who they are as a people group remains right <clears throat> well so when we look at Esau we're going to talk about that and see kind of broaden our perspective on what what that's talking about concerning Edom and why might God be specifically targeting them I mean there's a lot of people in that it, he, I think it says Edom and all all the other nations around them right basically so you got to kind of parse that out um, then you go down to verse 11 he says I will make myself known among them among who them did you mark your keyword on that <coughs> Okay, because you have said these two nations, these two lands, who are the two lands? Israel. And why is it called two lands? Very good. Excellent. The north and the south, because they had split, they had divided, right, during the time. And they will and he says, and we will possess them. Who's the we? Edom. We will possess them. Although the Lord was there. Now I love that verse. Because Right away, you start to see, wait a minute, <clears throat> what is the real problem with Edom coming against Israel? Because they're coming against God. It isn't, it, I think about, it, it, it's, you don't fight flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spirits of darkness. It isn't that, that they, they are, what about when Jesus says they hate me therefore they're going to hate you they hated, they hated me first or um, 
when they persecute me, they, 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 when they persecute you, they are persecuting me. There's all these scriptures that talk about how God is the one who seems to be behind the source of a lot of attacks. Would you say that's true for us in the New Testament as our part? Exactly. So often people will hate you, but they hate you because why? Because of God. Because they see in you a light um, which exposes sin, and that, that they don't like. That makes them very uncomfortable. In verse 13, it says, and you have spoken arrogantly against me. There you go. There's, there you go, smack. <laughs> I think there was a big, a big phrase like that. Oh, smack, right? And then it says, and I have heard it. Snap, that's what it was. What's going on today? Um, God hears what's going on. Yes. Yes. I, th I thought of that Zechariah 2, and I'll probably bring it up again. I think I wrote it in my notes somewhere, but Zechariah 2, 9, where it says, when you touch them, you touch the apple of God's eye. So you better be careful when you come against God's people. Now, that can apply to us as well. There is a, a truth behind that to us, but specifically concerning Israel. So when God made covenant with Israel, do you remember what God promised the nations around Israel uh, concerning their relationship with Israel as a nation? Bless Israel, you'll be blessed. Yes, you if you curse Israel, you will be cursed. Exactly. So that's what this is really talking about here, right? <clears throat> okay, so, and he does say, so I will make myself known among them when I judge who? You. You who? You who? Edom, right? So, again, you have to parse this out and say, well, again, with with prophecy, which is the, the hardest part of it is, sometimes there are short-term fulfillments in part, but ultimately there comes later what? A fulfillment of everything that is said. So although we do know that God did judge Edom to a degree in those days, because we see that through, through, even through what Scripture says, but yet, Scripture speaks of a day in the future when God is ultimately going to destroy Edom, right? They will not survive. My children will survive. They will not survive is what I remember in one of the verses we looked at. So what you can say then when you're looking at here, it says, when I judge you because of your hatred against Israel, is what it's saying in verse 11, so I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Them who? Israel. Right, among Israel, when I judge you, Edom. Okay, so just so this is why you, those key word markings are really important. They do help you keep it straight in your head. And if you didn't mark them, then you can miss it. Yeah, so it's very helpful to do that. And I do it for me all the time for the same reason, because I, I, when I'm reading it later, I can, I can get it figured out in my head in the moment when I'm studying that little piece. But then later when I go back and I read it again, I go, uh, now who? Who did what to whom? And what you know? Where does how does this line up? Right? Okay. Uh, and then then in twelve we see a repeated thing. We see in nine a repeated thing. In four we see a repeated. Th also in fifteen. So we have one, two, actually even three if you want to count the one in eleven. Then in twelve and then again in fifteen. What is that key repeated phrase that is our book theme? <coughs> then you will know that I am the Lord. So that is our book theme. And because that's our book theme, <coughs> then everything else is to answer to that. That's the way the inductive process works. Once you figure out your, your book's major theme, each chapter is to somehow address that book theme. So uh, when he says, and then you will know that I am the Lord, what is, what is going on in Ezekiel 35? What is God saying he's going to do there? Yes, an everlasting desolation. Isn't that interesting? So it's God never again going to be resurfaced once God does this thing to it, right? Uh, and so God says to Ezekiel to do what concerning Mount Seir? In verse 2. Prophesy against it. So who is Ezekiel again? He's God's prophet. And now he says, open your mouth, prophesy against Mount Seir, and let them know these, this is what the, the Lord says. And he says, and when I do this, what will they know? Then they will know that I am the Lord. Pretty awesome. Okay, 
Well, we just about pretty much talked through all of Ezekiel 35. Now let's add, let's do our outline. Let's do our our um, our detail work here together. <coughs> okay, so the first thing we want to do then is have a theme, which is our chapter title, right? Theme or chapter title. So what is our chapter for 35 again? It's pri our primary subject is who? Mount Seir. So how did you title it? Okay, okay, Pro and I, I'm going to add the word prophesy, because it's God saying it, prophesy, Mount Seir, <coughs> will be, um, and it was a, des I have it on here, an everlasting desolation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. How do, how do they become an everlasting desolation? <laughs> exactly. That works, too. Uh, they will be judged would be another way to tie. Okay, you just added extra words. That's all. Yeah, exactly. That's, all, that's perfectly fine. The, and again, with inductive Bible study, there are no absolute answers to titles and paragraphs, right? <clears throat> it is simply a matter of disciplining yourself to actually identify what is the major subject. Once you know the major subject, which we now know, we know it's about Mount Seir becoming an everlasting desolation. Now we can go paragraph by paragraph and probably bring out that subject of the judgment, but depending on what else is in that, that paragraph. So first, before we do anything else, though, I want to do a word study on Mount Seir. So Seir is number... 8165. Did anybody look it up? Okay, boy. Shame on you. <laughs> yeah, it does. Mean, Harry, does anybody remember why, why Harry and Shaggy? Do you remember why? Because of Esau, who was Harry, right? So it goes back. So therefore, it goes back to, yes, so red. Yeah, so it's red, it's hairy, it's shaggy, and it's related to Esau. Esau. Very good. All right, so here it's the, it's, they call it specifically in 8165, the land of Edom. They just give the geographical land of Edom, and they say it's south of the Dead Sea. Now, we all know where the Dead Sea is, right, on Israel's map. It's down to the, uh, to the south, and therefore it would go down into what countries? Jordan and Saudi Arabia, down in, tw at least in that direction, right? Um, exactly. Okay, so the other thing what I found is I went to a couple of verses, Genesis 36, 8 and verse 43. Both of them tell us a little bit more about this. Edom, Esau is Edom, Okay. That's the first thing. And you, they're also called what? Edomites. And has, does anybody know what some of the other names are? Or at least one other. The Edomites become the Idumeans. Now that's important because, do you remember Herod the Great? He was an Idumean. And what did, the, what did Herod the Great do? He tried to kill all the Jewish baby boys to not allow the, the Messiah to come, right? Was, isn't that an interesting connection? Also, the Idumeans are connected to the, uh, I hate to, oh, I shouldn't say it, but the Palestinians, yeah. right? Yeah. And to Yasser Arafat and all those. So I did a, a really cool study. I think I have it with me. Years ago, Jimmy DeYoung. Does anybody remember Jimmy DeYoung? Long time ago, he was really good. He lived in Israel, and he was actually a journalist. And he was present for a lot of the major talks. He oversaw a lot of the uh, covenants that they would make, right? Peace agreements that they would make at that time in history through the years. He's, I think, deceased now. But um, he, he did a really good study on this, and he did a lineage track for us and took us right to Yasser Arafat. And at that time, when I was studying it, that was years ago, like 20 plus years ago, maybe more. But he took us right to Yasser Arafat. And 
for me that was like, whoa, that was just a mind-blowing thing. But so just so you know, the Edom, the Edomites also call, also call Idumeans. Does she? Who said that? Sonny. So, ask Sonny is, hey, Sonny, is he living or is he deceased now? Does she know? Can you speak up again, Sonny? Okay, he's deceased. Okay, thank you, Sonny. That was good to know. <laughs> um, I lost track of him. All right, so that's Genesis 36 8 and also verse 43 you can go and read that about the about these titles and then what what do we know about how did Esau become the leader of this nation called Edom do they remember that we did this in Gen in he became yeah and how did he get possession of that land do you remember what happened I think we did this in Genesis Yes, God gave him that plot of land. And he said, and he actually said to um, uh, Israel, you're not to touch that land. It's not yours. And when God gave uh, Esau that land, what happened to Israel in the meantime? Where, where did they end up going? Yeah, they went to Egypt for 430 years while Esau was back on his land growing as a nation. And he gave birth to 12 sons. They called them chiefs or princes. And they spread out then and became a kind of a fracture of, of different little uh, subdivisions within that uh, plan, that plot of land. So it's really quite an interesting history. Uh, do you remember kind of their relationship? It wasn't great. No, it wasn't great. Just at, yes, very, very, very temporarily. But what do we know happened then in your, the years since then? Yeah, it, it all went south again. So it seems like there was a seed of bitterness that was planted within the heart of um, Esau <clears throat> concerning his brother. Uh, so I just feel like what happened is probably they did come together during the time when they buried their father, and there was a little bit of reconciliation or at least graciousness that went on at that point. But it seems like then they went their ways again, and it, it, it didn't last. And I, obviously, the Esau had to have conveyed in some way some information to these people that then got passed on through the generations. What does that tell you and I about how we talk about family members and about people and about how that can permeate and really poison a pot and cause generational hatred for people and people groups, right? Or for a certain family member and all of those cousins that came later. Nobody wants to have anything to do with them because they're whatever. It's really a, a, a bad thing. So we see this with Esau. But God said, I gave Esau Mount Seir as a possession. This is the Lord telling him us that. That was in. There you go. They did not. And so when that was, I remember when we did Genesis, when they came back and they were about to go back on their land, they wanted to pass through uh, Edom to get to the promised land. And they said, no, not only did they say no, they came against them in battle, right? So it was very contentious. Yeah, they had to make this big, yeah, very big detour. <coughs> okay, so that sets us up for who Mount Seir is, just so we got... In that context there, let's do our paragraphs. Verses 1 to 9 will be our first paragraph. Tell me, concerning Mount Seir and their everlasting destruction, why? Tell me why they will have this everlasting destruction from the Lord. They delivered them to the sword. They delivered them to the sword. Yes, okay. <laughs> because the Lord's against him. Okay, he is against him, but why is he against him? What does it tell us in five? Everlasting enmity. And then in one single event, they also delivered them to the sword. So of those two choices, which one do you think seems to be stronger than... Everlasting 
everlasting. I think that the everlasting enmity becomes stronger in just in pra pragmatic reasons because, yeah, in a one single event in history in 586 BC, they did deliver uh, Israel over to the sword, right? They, and we see this in other cross references, which I, I didn't put in here, right? Well, I might have. I got, I'll look up here in a second. But, um, <clears throat> but, well, they were, okay, what's another one? Yeah, they did not. You're right. Now, the, and you could make, the, they did not hate bloodshed, and so the blood was upon the land. Why was blood on the land a problem for God? Yeah, because what is blood? A high holy article of worship. And they were to do all these real special things to, to, to uh, honor and to consider it sacred so that they understood that when blood was shed, it was a picture of Jesus eventually that would come. It was pic pictured for them through their temple worship with the sheep, right? Every time they would bring in an animal or whatever, an animal to sacrifice, the blood would be shed. And that was all symbolic or pictorial of the coming once for all blood that Jesus would shed. So they, they shed blood. They uh, it also were, had a hand in uh, delivering Israel over to the sword at that specific time in history. But the bigger picture is, not only had they done those things, what? Everlasting enmity, right? Again, just back to remind you, if it's against the sons of Israel, what does again Zechariah 2, 9 tell us? If you touch Israel, what? You touch the apple of God's eye. Very interesting, isn't it? There's my eyeball. Okay? So they had everlasting empty against the sons of Israel. And behind that is the spiritual bigger picture again. Is this what you always want to do within, with, with your inductive work is to say, why is it bad that they were against Israel? What if they just hate him because they had a family feud? Isn't that a, is that a, big, a, a real problem? Why is that such a problem that God would make them an everlasting destruction? Well, because it goes deeper than that. The deeper subject matter is, who are they really against? They're against God, right? Okay, so they had everlasting enmity against the sons of Israel. Uh, the, and it said, you're right. Let's, let's just mention them or list them like... Carol, tell me all the things that you have. Let me do this in this color, maybe. Tell me your list. Delivered sons to sword and did not, isn't that interesting, did not, say it again, hate bloodshed. See again how how deep that really one that one really runs. Why why is the bloodshed an interesting subject matter? Because again, it's showing their disdain for the holiness of who God is. His pictures about bloodshed on the land. Was Esau aware of this? Did he understand the concept of the shedding of blood? Absolutely. And and Esau. Um, w was in that lineage where they were in covenant with God, they were doing the circumcision, they were, they were having their sacrifices. So th this is not something that was foreign to Esau. So the idea that he, he had disdain for bloodshed, and he, he thought it, of it lightly, in other words, he, spread, he would shed the blood without even a, a thought concerning how important it was. It, it, what do we do in the New Testament? What do we do today that's similar to that in bloodshed? We don't honor the blood of Christ, okay? But wh wh how do we disdain the blood? 
what are the things that we, how are we shedding blood with, with really hardly a second thought? What's our number one problem? Abortion. Abortion. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's other things as well, obviously. We see an awful lot. Look on the streets right now. We are definitely in the end times where we're seeing unruliness and, and hatred for the brother and this lo lack of love that, that's supposed to be there just among men among men. But specifically, th the amount of bloodshed that we have upon our hands as a nation ha with the abortion simply, with no thought. We, thought it, we think it's our right. We demand to have that right. Don't take that away. That's my body. It's my. Well, that's Esau without any concern for bloodshed. It's okay. It's, it, I, am, I am promoting my own self uh, interests. I am killing my enemies, and I'm taking that land and possessing it for myself, which becomes another problem <laughs> as we move on in this. So he talks about the, them at the time of their calamity, uh, what God does with Let's see, purple. At <clears throat> time of their calamity, the sword. And I just want to put that on there in order to give you that five, that specifically one there is um, 586 BC is the, the major one that's being talked of. Why do we know that that's the major one being talked of? What's our, our flow of thought in this book? All yeah, all the sieges. <laughs> and the one that had just ha accomplished. Where are we probably at this point in Ezekiel 35? What dating? About? We're after the 586. Yeah, so we're after 586, so we're probably eight, 585. Or maybe a little less than that, but, but we're... <clears throat> yeah, that's what I thought. So if we're presently in 585, then at the time of their calamity, the sword, that kind of gives us an idea as to where we're at on this. Now, I'm just going to read these two because I have room on my board to put them all, but we see Ezekiel 25:12. Somebody flip back, look at Ezekiel 25:12. Somebody, who wants to read that one? Okay, thank you. And uh, Ezekiel 36:2. Who wants to do that one? It's just the next chapter. Thank you, Susan. Um, also, I need Obadiah verses 10 and 11 and then verse 18. Who has Obadiah? Can you find Obadiah in your Bibles? I know it's a tougher one. You will. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Obadiah. It's, it's only one chapter, and it's verse 10, 11, and 18. I know. It's very hard. It's one page. <laughs> and then Isaiah eleven fourteen. Who would like Isaiah 11? Thank you, Karen. 11, 14. Yeah, you all get your Bibles open because I've got a few more to come yet. Not too many, but a few. We're going to hit Malachi and Zechariah and a few others. <laughs> Not right now, but as we progress, okay? I just want to, you know, gird up more insight on the idea that they had delivered them to, their, to the calamity that they did and why it is that God is against Edom, what is it that's going on, that God would single them out specifically. And it seems to me like concerning eschatology and end time events, they are going to come up over and over again. So for us to get a good grip on the understanding of why is God so angry at Esau in particular, Edom, the Edomites, his people, what is going on with them? All right, Ezekiel 25, 12. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's back earlier in our writing. Do, I mean, do, isn't that interesting how that connects forward then to where we are right here, where he says at the time of their calamity they did these things. And so, so Ezekiel twenty-five twelve. Now Ezekiel thirty-six two, which is about to come up for us again, but we're going to read it anyway. Wow. Okay, so what is Edom apparently doing apparent, from what Ezekiel 36 hints at? They're wanting to possess their land, right? So when 
Israel had this calamity in 586 where God took them off their land. They went, aha, it's ours now. It's now going to be our possession. Now, historically, when I was doing some research on this, I did not find um, a lot of information outside of the Bible that really gives us that insight about, about Edom going in and possessing the land. But internally within the scriptures, it's everywhere. So who do we believe? The Bible. Bottom line is this is our source of, of truth. This is the plumb line that we land on. Sometimes historical records will confirm and will validate what the scriptures read. But if there's a conflict and or a lack of information, what you can do is go back to the Word of God. And what's interesting about this subject concerning Edom is it doesn't just give us one verse. It gives us multitudes of verses about, about the subject of Edom and all the things that they did against God's people where they touched the apple of God's eye. And I, I think that's interesting. Does anybody understand about the idea of touching the apple of the eye? What do you know about that? Don't touch. Yeah, right. What if I came over to you right now and stuck my finger on the apple of your eye? It hurts. So what does that tell you about God concerning his people? It hurts him. It's, a, it's, it's very interesting if you look at it from a real pragmatic, technical you know, idea of touching someone's eye. My husband just had <clears throat> all these uh, eye surgeries, as you guys know, and just putting eye drops in for him was like torture. I, I've always wore contacts. No problem for me. But he does not want anybody touching his eye. And I, I thought about that when I was doing this homework. I went, yeah, I can see that. Because to touch the apple of someone's eye, even to put an eye drop in, is like, ooh, you know, and you, and you flinch. And so that's the, the picture. That's the pictorial imagery of that particular verse. OK. Uh, did Edom actually take over land? Scripturally, yes, they did. It talks about them going in and living on the land in the south and how then later God, and as a matter of fact, in the future, they're going to be in that same area and God is going to remove them and utterly destroy them off of that area. So <clears throat> if you think about it from that perspective, who's south of Israel right now? Israel. Well, yeah, there's Jordan and Egypt. So, and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and all that. Yeah. So on the whole, what kind of nations are those? What is their religious status? Islam, right? Today, it's Islam. So these are Islamic nations. So are they Christian? Are they Jewish? No, they're Islamic primarily. Now, that does not mean there aren't within each of those nations some people who are Christian. So we're not saying that no one is a Christian among them. But on the whole, the dominant thing is that they are, that they are um, Islamic and they are basically, again, it makes me think about, you know, where it was um, Second Peter 5, 8, where he says, uh, the devil prowls to and fro about the earth, seeking whom he may devour. So this is kind of what's going on here, is this is a spiritual battle. This is not about my land, your land. This is about who are they, uh, who are they coming against. And the bottom line to all that we're looking at here is they're coming against God. That's who they're really coming against. It looks like it's a battle for, between people groups when it's really a battle between the spirit of men against God being who he is. Oh, my man. Thank you. I got one amen. Okay, Obadiah. Let's read that one real quickly. Obadiah 10, 11, those together, and then verse 18. Okay, 18. The people of Israel will be a raging fire and eat them a field of dried stubble. The descendants of Joseph will be a flame roaring across the field, devouring everything. There will be no survivors in Edom. That's the one I was thinking of. So in, the, in that amazing, in that just like send chills up and down your arms. All. And so although we have no historical record, we have a biblical record that really says to us, you know, yes, they had a hand in what was going on in 586 B.C. We know Egypt did because remember what happened with Egypt, the eagles and 
and the vines that were broken and planted and all that back in those previous chapters. And one of them had to do with Egypt. They were trying to make an alliance to get help from Egypt, Egypt to come up and help them. And then at the last minute, here comes Babylon, and what did Egypt do? I tailed it, right, and left them high and dry. So there was that part of the picture. And they, but they, but and history shows that. But history does not talk about Esau, but God does. And his word gives us, Obadiah is a really good one. Now go to Isaiah 11, uh, 14. Okay. Wow. Okay, so I, again, you kind of have to have eschatology in your head, and it's talking about in the end times, what is, how is God going to work this all out? <coughs> we know that when Jesus returns, he, he rouses Israel up for these battles, right? And Jesus will, he comes from Basra, which is where? Yeah, it's in Edom which is Basra, which is Petra, which is right. And from Basra, he comes up that valley, past the Dead Sea, up into Jerusalem, where it says then the sons of David, um, it says they, even, the, even the old men fight as warriors like David. Yeah. They become mighty warriors. Okay, so I think that that Isaiah 1 sounds to me like it's talking about that time frame, although don't hold me to that one because... But I think it's talking about, is that also, does your Bible tell you if that's speaking of those end time things? Uh, yeah, in, that in that day. Good. There it is. So, there you go. In the day of the world. Okay. That's excellent. Uh, okay. So it was a good verse. All right. So thank question. you. Um, my understanding is the land that God gave Israel is much bigger. Oh, yes. Right yes. So The land that was supposed to be Israel's. That's right. Yes. And, and that's what I think happened. Yeah, absolutely. Back yes. His land. Yes. Listen, there are so many layers to this eschatology research and study, and it's very helpful since we've all done Revelation. We've also done Genesis. Um, we've done Daniel. I mean, we've got a lot of books. We've done quite a lot of work even in Jeremiah to see how they companion up together. But, but we could be hours in here in conversation on all these minute details. But the bigger picture here is just God is saying about Edom that he is going to destroy them. They're going to be an everlasting um, uh, desolation. Okay? Okay, we got to move on. Okay, 10 to 12 then is our next title. Verses 10 to 12. What was their... Their pro what was it that they did that really roused God? What did you title 10 to 12? There you go. I will judge you because... Okay, I like that title. I'm going to use your title. You have to give it to me word for word. I don't know about you, but this word because is at the beginning of every one of my titles. Why is God going to make them an everlasting destruction? Because they had this everlasting enmity against the sons of Israel. I will judge them because, now, what did you say the reason was? And I'm going to shorten it. Israel will be mine. Yes, I will, I will, I will. Yes. Yes. Isn't that cool? And see, those again, those, those, those technical skills and inductive process help you to really clarify if you'll do them. A lot of students want to take shortcuts and not do all the little steps. But when she says, make a list on the I wills, that really helps crystallize what's going on for you. 
Um, so what we saw then is they sought to possess Israel's two nations, meaning the north and the south, Israel and Judah, which had at that point in time had split and had become two nations, right? Timeline-wise, in 722, the northern tribes had, already, had uh, gone into their captivity already, 120 years before any of this started to happen with, the, with Judah, right? Then the south you now in Judah is, have gone through what we have observed in our time together with those three sieges, right, starting in 605 and ending in 586. Okay, and the reason he did that in, in verse 12 is what did God hear? Yeah, the reviling. Again, that, that enmity between them. I heard their revilings. Um, and what did he say in 11? He's going to do about that, those revilings. Because I will make myself known. Yeah, I will make and I will judge you. So I will deal with them according to their anger, their envy, and their hatred against Israel. I'm going to deal with them. What they have done toward my people, I will do. Right uh, now, um, Ezekiel thirty six five and Psalm one thirty seven five. Let's read those two. Uh, therefore, thus says the Lord: Surely, in the fire of my jealousy, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who appropriated my land for themselves as a possession, with wholehearted joy and with scorn of soul, to drive it out. Wow. So here what we're seeing now, again, this is why Kay said in one of the pieces of our homework where we were supposed to go back and look at several chapters and say, how do they relate? That was a, a daunting task, and I did part of it, and then I said, okay, enough, <laughs> because we already know it. We've looked at it. We've read it, so it's good to us. But if you did not catch that, these things, what he's what he has said back in previous chapters up to now, and then even where we're heading in, in 36, he's going to repeat a lot of this, where it just literally tells us, the reason I'm angry is they wanted to appropriate my land, right? My, whose land? My land. God says this, it's my land. You're trying to take my land away? Are you kidding me? Okay, Psalm 137.5, what does it say there? So there's a nice cross-reference again. Who has Psalm 137, 5? I told you guys, have your Bibles handy. I want to have you read. You're going to get a couple more, so don't give up on me yet. Uh, 137, verse 5. I love your new Bible. Mine looks so pathetic. <laughs> I need to get a new one, but I don't, how my notes are in there. Oh, it's terrible. I know, I did that for a long time. Did I? I might have written it down wrong, but is that what it says? It kind of applies still, but. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's verse what? Seven. 35 through, okay, so 5 through 7 is going to get you the full picture. That he's against Edom because, again, what did it say in the earlier verses there starting in 5? What had they done? Right. Okay, so. Right, they destroyed it. They leveled it to the ground. They, they, they were oppressive against it. And God says, these are my people, and therefore I'm going to destroy them. <clears throat> okay, so that, again, to me, uh, it's another cross-reference in the book of Psalms. It's talking about what they did, what Edom did as a historical fact, even if we don't have it in the history books. Okay. Verse. Five. Yeah, that one was really good because that's our next chapter, so it just gives you that support to it. Okay, now let's do 13 to 15, and we'll be done with this one on, on Edom. It's really, really been a good, a good look at this. <clears throat> okay, what do you see in 13 to 15? What is your primary subject going on in here? 
There you go. And as a matter of fact, he kind of says this a couple in a different couple different ways. You've spoken arrogantly against me, right? Multiplied your words against me. I have heard it. <laughs> Thus says the Lord, as all the earth rejoices, I will make you a desolation. So what, what time frame are we talking about there? When is the all the earth going to be rejoicing and they are going to be in despair? When is that going to happen? In that day, when Jesus returns as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, in the seventh bowl, he's going to come through. They're going to be weeping, but we're going to be rejoicing at Jesus' come, coming. That's in uh, uh, Revelation 19, 11 following. Okay, and then he says, as you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate. Now, that, now we're talking when? 586, right? So I will do to you. <laughs> and you will be a desolation, O Mount Seir, and all Edom, all of it. So that tells you it's not just a relegated to a certain section because remember, Edom or, or Esau had 12 princes and they would have spread out. So it's going to affect other areas as well. But on the whole, what we are really looking at is those present day, those Islamic nations who are against Israel to this very day. Are we having problems going on in the Middle East right now? Are we having problems going on in the United States? So what's going on in the United States for this very moment? Pro they're protesting Israel, defending itself against the, this onslaught from um, Hamas. Uh, Hamas, who is... Islam. So again, I'm not, I, it's not a direct connection to Edom, but there, the connection is the religion, right? The, and the religion becomes the enemy of God, not enemy as in we hate them because we're broken hearted over the fact that they don't love the Lord. We want them to come to faith. And trust me, my daughter just returned from a missions trip in that part of the world where she is, she is, ministering to those who are Christians over there in these different places. I won't name by name. But, but, um, and th this, is, this is a work that God wants in the heart of these people. He wants them to turn to him. But the, the whole gospel truth, you must give the whole message. You cannot give just the, the, the lollipop and the sweetness and the grace of God. You have to also understand the wrath of God. If you do not turn to God, there will be desolation for you. And so on an individual basis, this is true. But nationally also, God has determined certain nations will be completely obliterated when he returns. And they have to understand that. I remember in Daniel, I think it was in 7, it talks about there will be an extension of life granted for some of the beasts, and those beasts are certain nations. And that always kind of confounded most of us when we did that the well, the first couple times I did it, it was like, I'm not sure what that's really talking about, extension of life. Well, now I understand what they're saying is when Jesus comes back, he will separate the goats from the sheep. There will be some nations that will be allowed to survive, but who won't be? Who won't be? Edom. Edom will not be one of those who gets an extension of life. They will, they will be utterly destroyed. Why? Because they have an everlasting enmity with the sons of Israel, which at the heart of it is, they, they hate God. And God says, that I won't tolerate. And if you won't come to me, you will not exist. And in that day, as a matter of fact, he says, and if you won't come up and worship me at the feast that I will, that I will require of you in that day, it will not even rain on your land. Right? Okay, 13 to 15. Why then? Because they did what? Yeah. Yeah. They spoke arrogantly against me. And that me is who? God. Um, okay, so they rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate. Um, I will make them, uh, Edom, an everlasting uh, desolation. So now we got a couple of verses to support this, and then we're done with this part. Yay. Okay, Malachi 1, 1 to 5. Thank you, Kristen. Malachi 1, 1 to 5. Also, we need Micah 4, 11. Got Micah? Okay, and then Zechariah. Well, this is the one we've covered over and over. 
You can read off the board if you like. <laughs> Zechariah 2.8. <laughs> All right, somebody read, go ahead and read that, Kristen. Mal- Malachi 1, 1 to 5. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, said the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, we will return and build up the ruins, thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory, and the people for whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this, and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. Okay, so in that picture there, what God is doing is he's, he's, he's exposing the fact that even though Edom has seen generation by generation how God protects Israel and how and we have seen over and over Israel being removed from their land and then they come back and then they're removed from the land and then they come. one of them was a 2,000 year diaspora right and they came back 2,000 years and now they're back on their land no one ever thought it could happen which is why the church teachings became so bad really for a long time and it was because they just, we just, as human beings, we couldn't comprehend how is it possible that a people who's been dispersed around the entire globe could come back onto their land, reestablish themselves, set up a government, re- recapture their language, and take this desolate land. Somebody said that there were travelers during that day that would go through there and they would talk about the jackals and the dryness and nothing was living there. And when Israel was given that dry desert nothing and and it blows my mind that they say to this day oh that's our land it sat there for 2,000 years vacated and nothing wanted to go through it you know even the Bedouins went quickly because the land was dry barren and unproductive there wasn't even a tree on the land for miles and miles and miles this did not belong to anyone for 2,000 years God retained it as his land for his people and they were returned to it and then where are we now today look at israel has it how many of us have been there right beautiful lush green cities uh, uh, cities and structure and government and they have possessed it so the fact that that no one thought that it was possible and that's what malachi is is addressing because they, they said about Israel, it's going to be ours. He, he was indignant with them forever. Okay. Um, what about Malachi 4.11? Or rather, Micah 4.11, sorry. And now the many nations are being assembled against you who say, let her be polluted and let our eyes gloat over Zion. Wow. They're gloating over Zion because of her destruction. So that kind of takes you back to the 586. When they looked at what happened to Mount Zion, Uh, in that third siege and now all Israel has been dispersed there's just the scragglers left on the land and they're gloating over this they think this is a delight to their heart this is beyond the pale of I mean even you and I as human beings if we see someone even someone we don't like if they're down they're really sick they're on their deathbed they've been destroyed they've been especially unjustly even if anything like that we feel bad for them there should be some measure of humanity in you but not these people the Edomites were so delighted that that Israel fell okay so then the last one was that Zechariah 2 8 did somebody have that one or shall I read it you go Wow, after glory. He's seeking the, his own glory. God is. God is seeking his own glory. Okay, so now that finishes up 35. Any other questions about 35? That is an important piece, even though it's a very short chapter, it's a very significant piece of the history and the timeline because when you go into your end time studies, this is going to come up over and over again. And if you can kind of remember this one chapter, you can go back to it. You can look at your notes that we've done here today and you'll be able to say, okay, this is why God is doing what he's doing there. And um, if anybody wants to have that explained to them, how can God be so you know, unloving, <laughs> which is what the world would say, right? He's, he's a God of wrath and, and of judgment, and how could he do this to people? It's kind of like, why does God allow suffering in the world, right? They just want to blame God for everything. 
And what God says is for good reason. And he's going to say that again in 36. Okay. Any other thoughts? I'm going to give you a few verses you can write in your notes just as uh, the idea that this is all about spiritual warfare. In uh, John 15, 18 and 19, he says there, they hated me first. Okay. Uh, then in John 15, 25, he says about himself, they hated me without cause. You can read those, but just get your references. Um, then in John 10, 10 and 11, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might, might have life. That's talking about the good shepherd, John 10, right? And then, of course, 1 Peter 5, 8 that I spoke of earlier, it's the devil behind all this, and he seeks whom he, he may devour. So he's at the heart of this. Does this remind you of any, any part of our study previous to this? Where did we see Satan behind things? Who was who the king? The king of what? No, Ezekiel. Yeah. Who was the king that was equated to Satan? Remember the king of Tyre. There you go. The king of Tyre, right? So the king of Tyre is this personification that that in the in the prophetic word that was given about Tyre in its in its literal situation, God judges judged it and why he judges. It's all laid out what the king did, but then it transcends into the cherub who also exalted himself and it shows you this parallel what is behind what's going on with the king of tyre is satan what's behind what's going on with mount seir satan okay so that it's it i'm going to just write that on here this this is all about spiritual warfare mm -hmm. It is, and it's because they reject the truth. He said, I've turned them over to a del deluded mind because they've refused the love of the truth. Yes. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. Don't we see that even in our personal relationships, too, here in the United States with even family members who are just so hardened? And I can remember having conversations with my son, who now I have conversations with him, and he's like, oh, yeah. The, I mean, he's pointing it out right and left, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, he, he was listening. He was listening, right? So it's really exciting when you see those scales have come off, and they now see things for what they really are. They see the spiritual warfare that's been going on in their own personal life that kept them in darkness and and it all boils down to again why why were the scales there what is it what was ezekiel told about israel what kind of people is israel stiff-necked and stubborn they were not going to listen and they would not hear what he said but you speak anyway whether they want to hear it or not that's what that's been my life with my son for years and years and now the, the scales are finally off, and now he's, he's singing the right tune, right? And now he's on board with everything, all about removing the scales. That's what's going on there. So Mount Seir, and, and for us today to make good application with this, we just need to remember that these are not our enemies. We want to win them. But we also have to understand there is a prophetic utterance against Edom. It will be gone. And the reason it has to be gone is what Susan brought up earlier. Whose land is that that Edom is on? God's land. It was supposed to be Israel's. And in uh, Genesis 15, God laid it out from this river to this river and this wide. And it's, to, it's really all of Jordan on the what they call the, the east bay. I guess it's on the east of the Jordan River. I'm trying to remember it. Or southeast, west. But to, uh, where Jordan and uh, Ammon and Moab and all those are all that supposed to be Israel's all the way up to into uh, is it Syria it goes it goes all the way up to that river that um, Euphrates I think it is and then all the way down then to the great river probably um, what is the, what is the one in Egypt the great river the Nile, the Nile. thank you probably down to the I'm, I'm just guessing because showing my ignorance right now okay <laughs> okay <laughs> 35 minutes. Can we get it done? Probably not. Okay, I'm going to go through a, a little um, 
we have to do keywords in order to start us off, but I, I, I want to go through a list making with you that I think will clarify what's going on in 36 really easily for us. Tell me what you found for keywords in 36. Mountains of Israel, right? All right, mountains, mountains, mountains. How far down does mountains, mountains, mountains go? It kind of overlaps a little bit too, doesn't it? But the primary focus of the mountain stops at what verse? 12, right? 12, because in 13, when it talks about the mountains, it's talking about who on the mountains. Concerning the mountains in verse 13, who is the subject? They say to you, you are a devourer of men and have bereaved your nation of what? Children. Therefore, you will no longer devour men and no longer bereave your children, right? Your nation of children, declares the Lord. So it's making a switch to people. Did you notice that? It, it's kind of 13 to 15, sort of like a transitional piece. It goes from talking about the mountains, and then it, it's kind of shifting your mind toward, yeah, there's, this, there's the mountains, but then there's these things called people, and the people live on those mountains, right? All right, so then from 16 on, it's all about these people, correct, and, and, there, these, and other subjects as well. But so the land and the people, those would be your two major things there. Okay, what else? Oh boy, all those sin words, right? Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Holy. Yes, holy. Now, ho what holy? What's holy? God's name. So, really, God's name should have been a key repeated word and uh, phrase in there, correct? Mm -hmm. My name, all right? Nations. Huh? Nations. Nations, also, yeah. The, and the nations as in the rest of the nations and in verse 5 I think it says it also specifies Edom isn't that interesting first it gives you a bigger picture all the nations but then specifically Edom why because we're talking about spiritual warfare yeah. and so he's, he's nailing it for us he's also specifying them I think because that land belongs to God and to his people okay all right what about contrast did you guys do a bunch of contrasts in here holy moly were there contrasts I have so many lines drawn, right? Yes. Okay, tell me what your contrasts are that you've seen. Filthy. Okay. Scatter, scatter. Okay. Good. I look back on in 35, I'm against you, Edom, and in 36, 8, I am turning to you. Yes, yes. Um, well, you can also see it in verse 5 and 9. In verse 5, he said, I'm against all Edom who appropriated my land for themselves. Okay. And he says, I have spoken against the rest of the nations. In verse 9, yeah. what? But I am for you, right? So I'm against the rest of the nations and Edom, and I am for you. So it's right there in the text yeah. itself, okay. right? Verse 5 to verse 9. Very good. That's one of my contrasts that I marked on my page. <clears throat> okay. And, and why again? Why is he for Israel? And, and Because is Israel great? Have they been super oh, duper yeah. shining lights? Yeah. No. So why is God for Israel? Because it has to do with God's holy name, yeah. right? It's all about what God, about God in here, okay? In, um, in verse 3 it says, thus says the Lord, for good reasons yes. they have made you desolate. Uh -huh. So it's like it's not because of Israel. Right. For good reason. And for good reason, yeah. exactly. Um, what about he has spoken? In verse 2 he says, the enemy has spoken against you. And what does he say in verse 5? In my jealousy, I what? Against. Have spoken against the rest of the nation. So they spoke against you, Israel, but I am speaking against them. And then he actually, you can actually carry that down into verse 7 where it says uh, that you have endured th their insults. Okay, so there's some contrast going on there. Um, any others? Yeah, clean and cleansed. Yep. I mean, there were so many. Desolate and wet waste places and what's going to happen to them. That's in verse 4, the, the desolate wastes, right, and, and the forsaken cities. And verse 8, what does he say is going to do with that, those desolate waste places? Make them bear fruit. So isn't that interesting right there to see that? Okay, what about in verse 5 where he says, With scorn of soul, 
to drive Israel out for a prey. That's what you did, Edom. And what does he say in verse 8 about that? But what's going to happen? My people, Israel, what's going to happen? They will soon come. You may have cast them out, but they are going to be coming. So I'm going to undo all your work. <laughs> all right, so that's just a taste of it. There's a bunch of contrasts in that particular thing. But what happened for me was it was almost overwhelming to say, okay, I'm trying to, trying to really, who is the major subject in this? Is it the land? Is it the people or is it something else? So one of the things that caught my attention was how often that word my was in here. So let's make a list on the my's, okay, where God says my. <clears throat> Tell me what you see he, the, him calling my. Land. <clears throat> my land in verse 5. My wrath. Mm -hmm. My wrath. And that's in um, 5 and 6. I think I need a darker pen. Okay. My people. <laughs> Good. My people. Israel. He says that. Now I'm going to give you all the verses. 8, 12, and 28. He says that three times. These are my people. Okay. My wrath is... Uh, and jealousy in 5 and 6 but again uh, my wrath is mentioned again I can think I'll just add it up here uh, also in verse 18 my wrath okay 21, my, my holy name. there you go my holy name now how often is that repeated Anything that relates to the fact that he has a holy name or a great name? Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Have you, are you catching on? Okay, wait a second. All right, what else do we see? Yeah, my spirit. That's the fix. Am I going to fix all this with my spirit? And then 27 and, uh, covers two things. Okay. All right. So once you do that and you start to see the my, 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 what does that tell us about how God views all this? So what do we know about God here in this? Just... This is called analytical observation now. That we've moved from a pre, just a literal list making of what do we see in the text and giving it the scripture reference. Now we're going to say analyzing this, what is God conveying to us? So analyze it and tell me, what do you see? When God said, these are my people, this is my land, and this is my wrath, and this is my covenant, and this is my spirit, what is he saying to us? What are his characteristics and attributes that he's conveying? Okay, God, God's holiness. He's holy. Okay, personal. Possession. I didn't spell that right. How do you spell possessing? P-O-S, possess, P-O. I-N-G, there we go. I, mi I missed a few S's in there, okay. It's like Mississippi, how many are there? Okay, what else? <clears throat> if he's gonna do these things, he's just or righteous, and that might be another word. Mercy, yeah, there you go. I love that. Because what is our, our verse that I have said over and over and over? What was it in uh, 18? He desires that no one, that none perish, that everyone repent. I got, I'm trying to open it. Hold on. Um, whoop, I'm in the wrong one. That's 8, not 18. 
<laughs> I've gone back too far. 18, he says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? So that's Ezekiel 18, 23. And it was also, again, Ezekiel 18, 18, 23. Is that me? That's my phone. That's my husband. Hail to the king. <laughs> king with a little K. <laughs> That's, my husband. That's my telephone. I don't know why. I thought I turned it off, but I probably forgot. Now you know. That's my... <laughs> we know who's in charge at our house, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. How does he do that? How is he going? What is the process? How is God? Where did this start? Where did all this? The garden. Yes. So started in the Garden of Eden. God said, I will send a seed and he will crush the head of Satan, right? So your seed and his seed will have enmity against. Does that sound familiar? The enemy of God? They will, so in Genesis, he says this in chapter 3. So we start in the garden with this, this, this hatred of certain people against God, against submitting to him, coming to him in faith. What does he do then generationally? He is working a plan out, right? And in order to work that plan out, sometimes he has to put down kingdoms and raise other kingdoms up. Some kingdoms get too big for their britches, and God says, I'm, okay, that's, you've gone far enough, and he puts them down. So what is that about God? What is that characteristic? Hey, there you go, sovereignty. <laughs> God's sovereignty. Any others, thoughts? I'm just going to put on some weird things. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Uh, so he's all-knowing. He's present everywhere at all times. He's sovereign over it all. What else? When, when you start, when God starts using this, my land, my wrath, he is, he is creator. He is possessor. He goes to being, I am king of kings, I am lord of lords, I am the one true God. I mean, you can really expand on this in your mind and in your thinking. If you really sat down, not in the pressure of a classroom, but opportunity to really ponder on how he's, he's saying, these are mine. And, he, and in this, he gives us the spirit, which is going to be the new covenant, right? And what expense did that cost God? his son he had to sh shed his own son's blood in order that then this reconciliation could take place between God and us okay so I think once you do that that simple list what do you now see Ezekiel 36 being all about what is God trying to do here what does he say the most about my yeah he talks about my people my land whatever but what do you see happen when he starts in verse 20? They profane my holy name. And so what is he going to do? He says in 21, I had concern for my holy name. Is this starting to show you why God's going to do these things? What does he say in verse 22 about that? I'm about to act why? There you go. I am about to act, but for my name, which you have profaned among the nations. And then that contrast is in verse 32. So here's another contrast. Verse 22, contrast with 32. He says, it's not for your sake, in 22, in, 30, or in 22. And then in 32, he says, I am not doing this for your sake. I'm doing this for my holy name. Okay, so those give you a huge... And in the fact that you come up with that contrast... Then you step back and say, okay, because this is about the land and the people, but why is he doing it? For his holy name. So how do you title the chapter? What is he going to do concerning his holy name? There you go. Perfect theme. Now, um, 
I'm going to go to purple because the blue one is kind of wearing thin. Um, oops, I'm going to get this open. So he says of this one, I will vindicate my holy name. Now I want to go one step further because we did say that we could see basically there's two subject matters through which God is going to do that in a very specific way. And it really helps to crystallize for you and I why God ever chose Israel to begin with. We see what a mess they are. We see how they failed him right and left. And, the, and actually, in a way, their failure is actually more glory to God, in a way. But Paul addresses that. Should I sin all the more then? Never be it. <laughs> May it never be. Okay. So what do we see is the, are the two primary subjects in here beyond... Uh, my everything. He speaks about my everything. Well, in verses 1 through basically 12, what is the primary subject matter? The mountains. So the nation or the land, right? And then after that, it's about who? People. All the people. So how is God going to ho uh, vindicate his holy name? In my land? And in my people. Does that sound right? All right. Again, agreement. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, let's do the paragraphs. We're going to look at verse, basically 1 through 15 is going to cover in my land, but it's broken down into three paragraphs. So we're going to look at uh, 1 to 12 first. How in his land. What does he say about uh, his land? What's gonna, how is he going to vindicate it? By doing what? It's going to bear fruit. That's right. And right now, the problem with Israel is concerning their land, what has kept happening to Israel through the ages? What has ha been happening? Because remember, we're back here when they're in their first exile. There you go. They keep getting cast off, and then they get brought back in, and then they get cast. How does that vindicate God's holy name? Else yeah, very good. <laughs> because if you think about it, Genesis 15, God says, I am by covenant giving this land to you, uh, Abraham, and to your descendants after. And he promises him a land, a seed, and a nation. We know what the land and the nation are, which is what we're addressing here, the land of the nation. Where does the seed fit in this in verse th in chapter thirty six? Yeah, in the new covenant with the seed, which is what we said here. My spirit, the new covenant. So there's your land, seed, and nation right here in chapter thirty six, and the two primary ones that he's going to uh, vindicate his holy name through, which are visible, tangible expressions of how God is his glory is going to be uh, vindicated. His, his holiness is going to be vindicated is it through, through the fact that Israel is going to, again, be Israel's possession. Um, now, it is Israel's possession right now, right? But what's going to happen during the tribulation? Do you remember what Matthew 24, 15? They're yeah, they're going to be trampled over by the Antichrist of the end time. And what is, what is Israel going to do when the, when the abomination of desolation happens? She's going to flee, again, off her land. Isn't that interesting? So although we're seeing Israel back on her land in part right now, we're seeing part of what's going on in 37, right? But is it fulfilled yet? Totally. Not totally. So again, there's going to be a partial fulfillment that we're going to get to see, and that's going to excite us. We're going to say, oh, look what God's doing. 2,000 years off their land. Who could do this? Nobody but God. And now we're giving him praise, and now we're actually interpreting Scripture better because now we have fulfillment, so we see it better. You know, you don't want to ditch on the poor people before us who didn't have that insight, really. They were just confused, right, because they couldn't see how it could possibly happen. But is there anything too great for our God? Anything too difficult for our God? Nothing. And so knowing that, then, what we see in Ezekiel 36 is he's going to vindicate his holy name. First, he's going to do it concerning the everlasting heights. Why does he call them everlasting? What is that referencing? 
for us. There's a clock. Yeah. And it, does it stop with the millennial kingdom? No, it goes on into eternity. So this land that God, starting with Abraham, where he brought him out and gave him this land, he actually started with the seed promise in, in Genesis. But by chapter 15, he says to Abraham, I'm going to give you a land to seed in a nation, and through you I'm going, to, I'm going to bring glory to my name. You will bring me glory. They didn't do that, so they're off the land, on the land, off the land, on the land. So this yo-yo thing has been going on, and they are temporarily back on their land right now, but they are not going to stay there. It's going to be, again, another uh, diaspora, uh, so to speak. Uh, how much of Israel is going to leave, I don't know, but they are not in full possession of their land, and certainly not during the end times when the Antichrist is on the scene. So Revelation explains that to us, tells us how they are going to become... Uh, Satan is going to um, come against them to devour their children. And they, many of them will run, and they will go to this place called Petra or Basra for those three and a half years, those last three and a half years, when God is pouring out his bowls of wrath upon the, the kingdom of the beast, who is the Antichrist. So these are called the everlasting heights because it's an everlasting promise that God gave to, by covenant to Abraham. Everlasting, those are going to be for people. And the, these everlasting heights, say he says they will what? They will become Israel's possession. Now, I know we see that in part right now, but, we're, but it's not a, full, a completely fulfilled prophecy. But we are seeing signs of it. 13 to 15... What does he say about the land? It, the emphasis is on the land, but he starts talking about who? Children. The children. And so what does he say about the land? What's no longer going to happen to the land? My land. Yeah, that's right. My land will no longer be bereaved of her children. It will no, and disgraced for that reason. So you can give yourself some sub points on that, on that as well. So my land will no longer will no longer be bereaved of her children. That's in 13 to 15. And there's a variety of ways of saying that. You pick out the one that works for you uh, that conveys basically that message. But concerning the land, which at the time that this was written, who was on the land? Was Israel on her land? Was she bereaved of her children? Yeah. Yes. So again, even back in uh, 445, I think it is, when Cyrus lets them come back on their land after their 70 years in, in uh, their exile, they, they do get to come back on their land, but they don't stay there because 70 A.D. happens, and now they're off the land for 2,000 years. Now they're back on their land, but they're not going to stay there because then the Antichrist is going to come. So what we're seeing here is, a, is that right now, though, in this point in history, he's saying, my land is going to be Israel's possession. And the way he convinces them that his word is true is he gives them a temporal or, a, or an image or a foreshadow of what God will ultimately do for them. So he brings them back to show him them what about himself? Well, how about that he's sovereign, that he's able, that he's powerful, powerful to accomplish his word. All right, now, so my land will no longer be bereaved of her children. Now in 16, you guys are real quiet, 16 to 21. <laughs> he has to step back now and do a little explanation because they, they, were, they were already on their land and God kicked them off their land, right? He let the, the Babylonians come in and take them off their land. Now we see this whole section, I don't know about yours, but my whole thing is marked up with these black bolting lights, right? There is sin, sin, sin all over. Why did God 
have to remove them. Yes. Does that associate itself with our title? I will vindicate my holy land in my land and in my people. What did he do to Israel? In his wrath, he, 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 uh, I poured out my wrath on them and I removed them from the land because they profaned my holy name. So you could, I guess I could even shorten this just to say, um, I will vindicate my holy, uh, my holy name. I removed them from their land or I, how did I, how did I see it there? Um, they profaned my holy name, so I removed them. They being Israel profaned my holy name. So he's not just saying the nations do this, but also even my own people. They profaned my, my holy name, and they didn't get off scot-free. I didn't leave them on the land, but they profaned my holy name. Um, so I poured out my wrath. So that was his first demonstration to both Israel and the world that God does not tolerate that kind of profaning and let it slide, even amongst his own, his own people. Even his people, Israel, are held to accountability in relationship with God. Okay, now we're going into the ne That's all about the land. I'm going to put that up here. This is all about the, the land. And that's 1 through uh, 15, right? Now we're going to, we're, or actually th through 21, sorry. Okay, now we're going to switch, switch. Uh, it's like a subdivision to a subdivision. Yeah, you could, you could if you wanted to just give it one title. I'm going to, I am going to vindicate my holy man, name. In my land, and you can go 1 through 21, in my people, and then you could go 22 to the end if you wanted to do that. But it's not the most effective way of getting the whole pieces down. <laughs> However, you could do that. <laughs> if you want to cheat, go ahead. 22 <laughs> to 32. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I gave myself these subdivisions on my, on my I say, in, in my people, in, because it really did break down to two, two specific things his land and his people, and this is how he's going to vindicate his holy name. Okay, 22 to 32, what does he say he's going to do? Yeah, he will make them, and he's going to do that when, he's, when he does that, he says he's going to prove himself, right? Yeah, in verse 23, when, do you see that word, when? That tells you when he's going to do it. When, and he says, God, when I prove myself holy among them in their sight, I will do what then? I will prove myself holy, how? Uh, but that's the next paragraph, which that's in, after 32. We're stopping at 32, right? Well, actually, it does cover the whole thing. Uh, you're right. Okay, go ahead. Say it again. <laughs> yeah, they were, when he cleanses them from, okay. So, oh, that's a really, that's a really good, that could be a really good title as well. I'm going to prove myself holy among you when I put a new spirit within you, when I cleanse you, when I, I mean, you could do a lot of titles on that. Um, um, okay. I'm looking to see where I pulled mine out, out from. I looked at the part where it says, and you will live in the land that I gave you. He's going to do this cleansing, and then they're going to live in the land. And the reason I went there, this is my thinking on this. 
when you're, when God is doing a spiritual work, it's not as tangible for people to look at it and say, oh, ha, huh, look at there what God did. Sometimes the tangible is what makes people wake up to the spiritual. So when God says, I'm going to prove myself holy among them, I'm going to do it when you see my people living back on their land again, in the way, in the manner which I, and when, when they're brought back into the land, then how are they going to be brought back into the land in 33 to 36? What is he going to do? Talks about fortifying and inhabiting uh, his land, but with what kind of people? Because of what you just said in the previous chapter. Cleanse people. He actually says it in the beginning, I will cleanse you from all your iniquities. I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be re rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation. So there's a visible, tangible thing that they can look at to see that God has vindicated his holy name. Because the nations were saying, aha. See, we always want to go straight to the heart of you know, the gospel, which I totally am agreeing with. Because it's certainly a piece of this message. And it's a big piece for the ultimate conclusion of this. It's also a really big piece because it's one of the ways we know history has not been fulfilled yet. These things have not yet happened. Because where is Israel in their relationship with Jesus Christ? Have they accepted the seed? No. Do they have the Holy Spirit because they've not yet accepted their Messiah? No, because how do you enter into the new covenant? By believing that Jesus is the seed that God promised, right? Uh, Galatians chapter 3, the whole thing. God preached the gospel to Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him to, uh, as righteousness. And who is that seed? And that seed is Christ, it says in uh, Galatians 3, 8. So, so God is is doing a spiritual work, but he's doing it through a tangible thing that he's going to be doing first. We know subtly behind this, and it's a big piece for you and I, because it's, a, it's, a, it's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that ultimately will matter. But, but for God to prove himself to an unbelieving nation, he has to do things that are visible, that they can tangibly see, which is why I kind of... I. I'm going to reinforce the, the cleansing part in the next paragraph. But in this paragraph, how is he going to vindicate his holy name? He's going to take them from the na nations, gather them from all the lands, and bring them to, to their own land in verse 24. 30, um, um, I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the of the tree. They, you will never be disgraced by famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that you are not good and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Remember, when does Israel actually come into this covenant of grace? How, where in the tribulation? At the very end. They have to see that God is doing these things, even for them to turn. When, when Jesus appears in the sky, they will then turn. But it says in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, what is Israel doing in order to get to that place where they turn and look upon him that, whom they have pierced and they weep? What are they doing each in their own houses? Repenting. They're weeping each in their own houses. And then he says, and when they do that, I will pour out my spirit upon the house of David, meaning the nation. So to get there... First, God has to tangibly take them through things that they're visibly watching and going, wow, we missed that one. Sure enough, he is our God. Now they will bow their knee. So for me, as I'm going through this in a pragmatic way, I'm saying as an expression of how is God proving himself holy? Yeah, there's a spiritual work that he's, he's going to do in order to bring that about eventually. But first and foremost, he has to put the people back on the land and do some tangible things that will make them recognize that God is doing something supernatural. The very fact that they, are, that they have been told, when you see the abomination of desolation prophesied to you through the prophet Daniel, you must run, you must flee to the mountains. The fact that God fulfills that tangible word and they flee to this place called we call Petra, but God refers to Basra, and when they do that, they should be able to look at that and go, wow, God did do what, exactly what he said he was doing. It's a tangible thing. The spiritual part will come also a, as a result of that. I will prove my, my, myself holy when you are my people on my land.
Okay, and then in 33 to 36, which we've just kind of talked through also, that's where he says, and I will fortify and inhabit my land, but he calls it cleansed Israel. It's clean, the cleansed land. I'm going to put cleansed Israel. It doesn't actually say cleansed Israel. It just says you will be cleansed. But I put the word Israel in there for clarification. And then he says concerning that, what does he say? He makes a real dogmatic statement there. In verse 36, right at the end. Yeah, I have spoken and I will do it. See, so he's going to do something tangible for them to see. And then, and then we see the conclusion then is 37 and 38. And what does he say then? What are the, then what? Yeah, it's going to be filled with flocks of men. And then what will they know? Yeah, then they will know. So the, okay, put on there. Tell me again about the flocks. The land will be filled... with flocks of men. I hadn't put that on my title, but I like that. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And that right there is our book theme. Isn't that awesome how that all comes together so beautifully? That flow of thought, you stay in the continuity of your book theme, you follow how does he, who is he judging, or, or what is he doing, what is his work, what is his, re in this case, what's the reason behind it all? He's going to vindicate his holy name. That is at the crux of all this, because why? Well, he showed us in 35, this is a spiritual battle. It is about spiritual warfare between what I have said and what the world will submit to. I, I am the Lord, I am, the, I am Yahweh, I am the, the only, I am the I am, I am the only God, right, the one true God, and they must bow their knee to that, and if they won't, then I will judge them. And boy, is that a message. And I didn't have time, but this is our I will list that we all did together. You know, if there, do you have, anybody have any thoughts on those I wills, I will, I will? How many I wills were, yeah, became ridiculous, didn't you? You're almost rewriting the whole chapter. I know there are. You're right. There are a lot of them. But in this one, she wanted you to actually make a list. And I went, oh, my God. I did do it, but it was like forever and ever and ever, right? Um, all right. Um, so the word vindicate means to sanctify, vindicate, and manifest as holy. That's what literally it means to vindicate is to, is to manifest as holy in opposition to the heathen reproaches of it uh, by the Jews' sin and their punishment. That's in Ezekiel 36, 20. Um, my jealousy, his jealousy is his, is his zeal for his own people and also for his own holy name. He, he's, he's zealous for his people because he's zealous for his holy name. He chose them, although they were weak and sinful, and he will use them, but he could have used anyone. And we all would have done the same thing. I, how many times have you heard the question about Adam and Eve? Well, what if it had been a different Adam and Eve? What if Eve hadn't sinned? What if Adam and It wouldn't matter. The next one would have done it too, right? Because we're all sinners. So God chose a nation knowing they were broken vessels. And he uses them to continue to personify that he's holy, he's just, he's righteous, he's full of love, and he's full of compassion, and he has a salvation plan for us, and he desires for us to come to him. He wants to bless us, not to curse us. He, he begs that over and over throughout the book of Ezekiel. So, amen? Nice work. Y'all did good. All right, thank you. We'll see you all next week. And I did that.